welcome back to this part three of these interviews with you, Crystal and Leah. Today I want to talk a bit about what your experience was like when you got back from the World Cup in your footballing careers playing and then since then how people have heard about your World Cup story and we'll talk a little bit about women's football in general. So my first question is what was it like in the months after you returned from the World Cup? Leah do you want to start? It was trying to understand really what had happened to us because it was all so surreal and um, because there was, wasn't was very much interest really in the country here, um, it was purely telling family and friends or looking at our scrapbooks, putting scrapbooks together of what had happened to us for a whole month in Mexico City. So that in itself, looking back, was, was very odd. Um, also with school life just went on you went to school you got on with school you didn't talk about Mexico particularly so everything just went back to how it was before um we went we went to both Sicily and Mexico um in 71 and therefore just carried on playing at Chilton Valley um in the way we had before in the leagues and uh, still catching two buses to train in Nothing had changed in that respect. Um, unfortunately, there was a ban on us when we came back. Uh, the FA, WFA had banned some of us for three months, some for six months. And I think that was dependent upon age. Um, so that was quite ridiculous, to be perfectly honest. But we didn't, again, we were so young, we really didn't take on board the magnitude of that and probably how it affected us over the years actually uh, because we really then felt we really shouldn't have gone to Mexico because it, it wasn't seen to be the right thing and um, however not one of us would have changed not going um, we had a fantastic squad and it, it was amazing but I think it did affect everybody in the squad differently. Mm -hmm. separate then to the ban that already was on women's football so you went during the general ban on women's football that stopped you participating on the pitches but apart from that when you got back from the world cup they put a specific ban on the team that went to mexico that's right okay. they did and that affected everybody differently and i think um even for chris and i who played for chump valley we were actually um directed to join another club it changed quite a lot in in how we were playing with Jump Valley and and that was very difficult and and therefore being as young as we were we made some difficult decisions which would probably would be different now mm -hmm. but why were you directed to join another club then because of the ban and that they felt that Jump Valley would no longer be sustainable um, and proved over a period of time to to be the case but I think it was so that Chris and I who played for Chilton Valley could carry on playing mm -hmm. I think that was the reason for it but looking back it probably wasn't ideal mm -hmm. okay so you, you got back from all that excitement and you had three months not being allowed to play football yes well, by the time we were told, yes. How about you, Jill? What was it like for you when you got back? Was it the same? Um, yeah, it was uh, very similar to Leah, although um, I still stayed with the team I was with, which was Tame Lake. I had the three-month ban the same, but then just carried on after that. You know, it, it didn't really... As I say, at the time, I was probably you know, really frustrated that I couldn't carry on playing for that time. Because um, obviously the season did not, was just starting when we got back. Um, and then was, you know, really itching to get going again. But um, yeah, that, that's the only thing I can think of that, you know, the ban. And then, then I, as I say, I just carried on playing with Tame. So it didn't, it affected me at the time, I suppose, but not to a, a great... A, a, degree as Leah and Chris because they had to change clubs mm -hmm. 
so with me I just carried on as, as normal really mm -hmm. and how about you Chris uh yeah well because my story is similar to Leah's but um the reason we couldn't stay with Chilton Valley uh really was because they were banning Harry for life um so he got a long ban and um we want uh, at the beginning we wanted to stay with Chilton Valley because it was a great team why would we want to leave but then when we were directed to leave was the reason that um Harry was being shut down as such. Mm -hmm. uh, he got a lifetime ban. And uh, yeah, that was, a hen that was the end for him. Um, I found out later that he did try to um, get the ban lifted, but they refused. If I understand this correctly, the FA did not take a women's football team to represent England in the World Cup, but Harry uh, stepped yeah. forward and did, and represented the country. And on his return, he got banned for, from coaching for life for doing that. Yeah, he did. And um, I think it was, and Leah would know best, but it was the WFA that initially banned us because the FA didn't come into women's football till 72. Mm -hmm. um, Possibly the reason for that was because they saw the success in Mexico. I don't know. I can't say for sure. Um, but um, it was a few years after Harry got banned that he, um, his son told us that he tried to come back into the game and they refused. So. That's really bad. Yeah. So when you got back from Mexico, it sounds like there wasn't a big... Um, people weren't making a fuss over you about your experience in the World Cup and then a few years ago um, people have started to did start to find out about the story so how exactly did that happen Chris? Well um, one day I was at home and Leah rang me and um, her brother had well actually perhaps Leah should say about it but her brother had heard about the, um, the National Football Museum Mm -hmm. and Jean Williams, Professor Jean Williams, and they were doing um, a, a big thing of women's football and they had very, they had no knowledge about the Mexico um, mm -hmm. World Cup. Um, so he encouraged Leah to ring them up, which luckily Leah had just um, retired, so she had time to do it. Mm -hmm. And she rung them up and um, they were really interested and asked, asked us to go up to Manchester Football Museum and talk about our experience. Mm -hmm. And that's how it started. And then the three of us, because we were still in contact, uh, so Leah, Jill and myself, we decided to find the rest of the team. Mm -hmm. And it became important to us mm -hmm. to find the rest of the squad and give recognition to what Harry had done for women's football. Mm -hmm. and, and that's been what we've been about ever since, really. Mm. Yeah. And how long ago was that then? It, was, it started, just to mention, there was a, a BBC journalist, Bill Wilson, actually wrote an article Mm -hmm. um, this was, I think it was February 18, 2018, mm -hmm. um, and in the article it mentioned 10 items to the history of women's football, mm -hmm. and I think number eight, if I remember rightly, was um, Mexico 71, and that's what my brother sent to me, and that's what started the ball rolling. Mm -hmm. um, so, forever grateful for his relationship with Jean Williams, Professor Jean Williams, and the National Football Museum, which was Belinda Scarlet, because um, they had all the history that, that went into that particular article. Mm -hmm. um, so from, we sort of started looking at talk, I started talking with Chris sort of March time, and then we contacted Jill as well. And uh, we went up in May 18, Chris and I first to, uh, talked to the museum mm -hmm. and did a short video and uh, and then Jill was on board with us and it, it carried on so it it was 
just amazing that it happened really. Um, yeah. The timing was just perfect. I literally had only finished work in the December and um, had I still been working, I don't think I would have followed the article up at all. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So yes, it was meant to be and we're very grateful for that. And then since then it's been Jill, Chris and I encouraging everyone and trying to find everyone. So it's been fabulous. Yeah, I'd just like to say after it, that did get the ball rolling and then we wondered how to find the rest of the girls because we didn't know how online they'd be. So um, we used um, the BBC quite a bit, to be honest, and that's how other people got on board. Um, I don't know if you remember Danny Baker show, but I decided I was going to ring up Danny Baker show. And because of that, Ian Young's heard, heard the show and he got on board and he found a few of the girls mm -hmm. and he wrote a fantastic article about the, um, the um, Mexico World Cup and um, it was on, it was really well received and um, that's what got the ball rolling bigger. Mm -hmm. um, and then I think we'd lost, there were still four players to find. Mm -hmm. So then I went on Radio 4, Saturday Live, and a lady called Cat Whiteway, who's a people finder, mm -hmm. she came on and helped us and then that got us all on the one show. So it was all like media attention, mm -hmm. you know. So, and um, yeah, in the end, we found everybody. So. Okay, so over the years, you had lost contact with most of the squad, apart from the three. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and we hadn't seen all the rest of the squad. Maybe one or two, I think Val and that. But most of the squad, we hadn't seen for 47 years. Wow. What was that reunion like? Jill? Yeah, it, it, so as, as Chris was saying, we, we did go through the media to, to try and find all the girls. Leah and I went on local radio as well and um, put the call out um, and one by one they were found. And um, yeah, it was a, a great piece. Um, we did, um, I think it was for the one show, but it was um, Jasmine Harmon. We, we had to go to Lincolnshire was it Leah? I'm not quite confident. Yes, Boston, yeah. Lincolnshire. Boston, Link yeah, Boston, Lincolnshire. And we'd got, and this was our first reunion of all the girls that we'd found. So that was really brilliant anyway, that we'd actually meet up. We knew the weren't ones, but we were still missing two of them. Mm -hmm. And um, and then they surprised us with Jean Brecken. She, she came out from behind the curtain, basically. And that was brilliant. And... Um, and the the last one to be found was Paul Arena. Um, and Leah had already um, got a number for her and um, sort of been fobbed off a little bit, I believe. Um, mm -hmm. yeah. But Paula had already been in, had been contacted by somebody else to say about this reunion. So she appeared and uh, Leah wasn't best pleased <laughs> yeah. because she'd been fobbed off by her and, and now she knew the reason why. But yeah, I mean, it was absolutely fantastic to to have got us all there together. And the reason we were in Boston now, I remember, um, because Lillian, the, who's our goalkeeper, she she lives um, not far from there, um, but um, isn't in best health. So that was the, the best meeting point. Um, but yeah, it was absolutely fantastic. And, and you wouldn't have thought we'd have been apart at all, really because we just um, just got on so well. And, you know, obviously we changed in our looks and, and appearances, obviously, but we were still the same inside. And, and it was great to, to get everybody else's recollections of Mexico because we'd got our own, but, you know, pe other people were remembering different things. Mm -hmm. So it, it was um, lovely to hear all their stories and, and then memorabilia all came out as well. So 
yeah, it was fantastic to to all get together after all that time. You know, how long ago? I'm not quite sure, Chris. Um, when we started looking, when we had that meeting, now was that, what, was that two years after? Yeah, I think it was just before the Women's World Cup. Um, so it, when we met in Boston, because yeah, the Women's World Cup came along, and it, and it just snowballed, didn't it? Mm -hmm. You know that the attention from the media was immense. Yeah. yeah. From never talking about it. To, mm -hmm. Yeah, it was crazy. It was really crazy. I mean, there was always somebody getting in contact and going, can you come on here? Can you do this? Can you do that? It was quite amazing. Yeah. So, but um, in We way, probably, I don't know if you've just mentioned about Carol. It was the 3rd of June, so not, 2019 so this took us right up from so if you take it March 18th say onwards with all what went on mm -hmm. it wasn't till the 3rd of June we actually um, met our captain and, and what had been done BBC breakfast they'd managed to locate Carol and Jane McGubbin had contacted Carol to meet her at Chilton Valley's old ground in Luton Mm -hmm. and there would be a surprise and that she would be meeting Jan and I think possibly yourself Chris is that right or was it yeah, was, Jan? yeah she only knew that she only knew that me and Jan knew where she was where she was yeah. so we as many of the squad that were around then actually went up to Chilton Valley's old ground um up in Ashcroft in Luton mm -hmm. and uh, surprise Carol. So that's when we found our captain. Mm -hmm. So, and she was just absolutely, well, it was, it was a very emotional time. And I think actually for all of us that were there, unfortunately yeah. we, we hadn't found Paula and Jean and Lillian at the time, but it was so important important how we just all gelled but it was very emotional I think yeah. all of a sudden we realized between us all what, a what an amazing thing we'd all been through together yeah. and the scrapbooks were out and <laughs> memories were shared and it was that was a fabulous uh, day actually and lovely for Carol <laughs> after so long not talking about it and then like you said I think before Chris you meet people and they remember things that you might have forgotten and you remember things they've forgotten and you probably hear stories about what happened and you're like oh yeah uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah exactly exactly in the last two years what else has happened for you all what other things have you done uh, Chris well um I think uh, what well, after we'd all managed to all get together mm -hmm. um UEFA got in touch with us and the Women's World Cup had, well, was right in the middle of it and it was just before um, England were to play the USA mm -hmm. and um, UEFA got in touch with us and said they wanted to take us to um, to the game in Lyon. Okay. So we, had, we only had like a, well, um, it was just me in contact with... Um, the UEFA girl, and we had to get everybody's passports, everybody's details, get it all together in like, I don't know if Leo will remember, but it was only a couple of days. Mm -hmm. and, yeah, um, it was. Yeah, yeah, we had to do it all in a couple of days. Mm -hmm. And um, all the girls were coming from all over different parts of England, like Cornwall, Norfolk. Um, so, and we all had to meet at yeah. East Houston Station and we all got on the Eurostar and off we went to Lyon all together on the train and um, yeah traveling like we traveled all those years ago and um, yeah I think that was quite emotional getting to the station and we were all there and you know mm -hmm. yeah it was brilliant and um, yeah it was fantastic um, I think there was just a couple of girls that couldn't go for certain reasons, but mostly it was most of the squad. Wow. And, um, yeah, and, um, yeah, it was busy and full on. And um, as we were traveling there, there was loads of interviews with different media people that 
because it was all um, the World Cup attention, mm -hmm. etc. And um, yeah, so when we came back, we wanted to have our own private reunion. So we organised one and then we had lockdown. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So we had to cancel it, and we, we haven't got ever personally since then, really. Oh. Only we um, yeah. we've never met. So the problem we have, we have never met as a whole squad. No, the fourteen of us have never been together all as one. Um, but I think it's also worth with the Leon trip. Um, Jill will recollect this as well. We, we were so lucky to be taken by UEFA mm -hmm. um, to watch the Women's World Cup. It was just incredible. But Jill and I decided to go to La Havre to see Argentina, England, because we felt that was quite poignant and important to us. It was an opportunity we didn't want to miss. So Jill and I um, went to La Havre to watch England versus Argentina. And I think I'll hand over to Jill because the most amazing thing happened while we were there. And, it, and it's just something we're going to cherish for the rest of our lives. So over to Jill, really. Would you like yeah, to tell um, the half story? Yeah, it, it's, it's quite an amazing story, really. Um, as Liz said, we caught the ferry over to La Havre. And um, a, another friend of ours was going to meet us the next day. Mm -hmm. I think it was the next day, wasn't it, Leah? the same day yes it was yes anyway she was coming on the Eurostar um so but Lou and I got confused somewhere along the way thinking she was coming on the ferry so we got on a tram to go down to the ferry station and we got off the tram I both realized at that time she was coming in at the train station so we got back on a tram round to the train station we walked into the station and waiting looking around and um couldn't see our friend and then there was a group of uh, women coming through and they'd all got the same t-shirts on as if they were a team but older ladies say older same age as us mm -hmm. and um very so young said, yeah very young so I said to Leah I says I think they're the Argentinian women's team to some you know they just looked at it and um she, Leah says no it can't be but they'd got a film crew with them uh -huh. and um so Leah says you go and stand over there and I'll take a picture of you so I can get him in the background. <laughs> so I'm stood there posing and um, Leah took the photograph. But anyway, um, they were all gathering in the station and I was pretty sure it was them. But anyway, we, we hadn't met our friend, so we just missed her. She'd gone off to go to the hotel. So anyway, we went back out of the station to get on a tram. Whilst waiting for the tram, this team came out of the station and they were being filmed. And I said to Leah, I oh, know it's them, I'm sure it's them, go and ask them. So Leah went over and asked the people that were filming, is this the Argentinian women's team from 71? And they said, yeah. And Leah says, well, Jill and I played for England in 71. They couldn't believe it. And they were so amazed. And they, so they grabbed us and hugged us and took pictures and everything. They couldn't believe that, wow. you know, they'd met somebody from England team that played them all those years ago. So. As I always say, it was a sliding doors moment, uh -huh. on and off the tram, in and out of the station, still missed our friends, but <laughs> met up with the Argentinian girls, which was, um, it was meant to be. amazing. Yeah, it was. It was meant to be. Fantastic. It was meant to be. And we were reminded of our scoreline and one of the players <laughs> that was there had um, pleasure in reminding us of that she'd scored the goals and yeah. but it was lovely it was fantastic it was yeah. the most they couldn't uh, we couldn't obviously talk argentine and they couldn't talk english but she kept saying four four <laughs> i said yeah, yeah okay we know <laughs> we can remember yeah we don't bear any grudges <laughs> no, no. <laughs> so, so that that was yeah fantastic and the game you know we went to the game but um going back to the UEFA one you know that was an all expenses trip paid as well huh? um to on the Eurostar the hotel getting to and from the game and everything I mean it was a obviously it was a flying visit mm -hmm. we stayed the one night and then had to travel all the way back you know the next day but 
yeah, it was, um, there was a lot of highs and lows in that game as well, yeah. obviously, um, missing a penalty and things like that. And the next morning, then Leah and I, Chris was there, but um, Leah and I went on to the breakfast TV down in Leon. This was about seven o'clock in the morning, I think. So we had, we'd only had about three hours sleep. Yeah. Just, to, you know, giving our opinion on the game and, and, and that and what happened. So, yeah, I mean, it, it was a great time. And all the girls, it was just fantastic to, to be there again with all the girls and reliving it. And we had VIP seats and a box and everything. So, you know, it was amazing that that all came from, you know, us being found as the Mexico 71 squad. It was quite amazing. When our story has come out, people have found it quite emotional. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's what most people say is how it, it, it's made them feel emotional. And uh, I, I hope in a good way as well, really, rather than a sad way, because we had, you know, we had this opportunity and we took it. Mm -hmm. So we're happy that we did do it. Mm -hmm. and, um, I can see why people say that, because it's, it's very shocking, the story, when you hear it now, you know, you've lived through it and you've spoken about it now quite a lot, but when people hear that story for the first time and what happened to you, like just even today talking about the fact you got back from doing that and you were not, you were actually banned from playing football, which just seems ridiculous to do to like young girls that enjoy playing football to ban them from it. Um, mm. It is quite, it's like very shocking to hear. <laughs> I can understand why people say that, that it's emotional because, yeah. yeah. Um, okay. Can I just say, with, with going to Leon, um, an important point that I think we'd all like to make, we, UEFA were just incredible, as, as Jill's already said. And we actually went on the, they brought us over for their, it was part of their campaign. Mm -hmm. Together we play strong. Mm -hmm. And it was very important that they could they could understand a story and the significance of it in the women's game. Mm -hmm. You know, it's nearly 50 years ago. So I just thought it's important for people to understand how supportive UEFA were. Mm -hmm. And I think they realised that we were just wanting to embrace the women's game, the girls' game, and try to inspire young girls and women to play now. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that is all we do want to do. Mm -hmm. it, yeah, that it's important to us, and I agree with what Leah said there, it's important to us that our story is heard by young people that have dreams. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so we don't want to keep quiet anymore. Yeah, good. Yeah. You shouldn't. <laughs> well, it sounds like UEFA were really, really supportive in that, and they've been a big help then, obviously, in, in sharing this story and giving yeah. a platform to talk about it on. Maybe on a contrasting note, how about um, the FA since then here in, in England? Have you sort of received any recognition or apology maybe for what happened, um, Leah? We haven't received anything written or... We, we were invited to the um, England... Germany game at Wembley mm -hmm. and we were invited by the FA uh, and we had a box at that game and up until that point we had had no contact with the FA they for some reason didn't really want to recognize um, the Mexico 71 World Cup be it official, unofficials, absolutely, um, from our perspective, is, is it really isn't important. It happened. It, it showed a part of the women's game. So really, we could never understand their take on it. And it was a difficult time, I know, for them. And But it was very difficult for Harry Bat. And, and that's probably another section all by itself. Mm -hmm. Because however people want to look at it, Harry Bat and his wife, June, and, and their family gave so much to women's football. And, and a lot of women were so lucky to have experienced from 1969 to 1972, traveling abroad uh, with him. So 
it's a shame that the FA, for some reason, just wouldn't recognise it. However, we were spoken to at half time at that game, um, and uh, Sue Campbell came in and and did talk to us, um, and actually. It was an apology that nothing had been said before, but I think it's just, can we just move on from it, but have it understood it existed? It is, it, it, we're not looking for anything else apart from people recognizing that it happened mm -hmm. yeah. and recognizing. <laughs> Perhaps women's football would have moved a lot quicker. And I really feel quite strongly, and I think all the girls will agree with this. Yeah. Um, had Harry and the FA at the time, WFA, got together more uh -huh. and had Harry to use his contacts and, and, and his ability to just make things happen, mm -hmm. um, they shut it down and really it's taken an awful lot of years for this to catch up. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. It shouldn't have taken nearly 50 years for women's football, or let's say 40 years. The last five, 10 years, slowly but surely, things are improving. Mm -hmm. But um, it could have been a lot sooner. Mm -hmm. yeah. Um, yeah, I think, like, you know, the FA talks about now wanting to grow the women's game. Let's think about Harry, for example. He was the one that enabled so many girls to play and they banned him for life. So, you know, no one's gonna be able to change what happened, but I think it will be very, it would make a lot of sense for the FA to kind of acknowledge that and recognize it and use it because that is the history of women's football. You are the history of women's football. And, you know, it's not like women's football started in 72 when the ban ended. It started way before that, even though they weren't recognizing what was going on. Yeah. It's important, I think, to all of us and the whole squad that Harry Bat gets recognition for what he did contribute to women's football. Mm -hmm. yeah. And the vision he had in the 60s and 70s is absolutely amazing. Mm -hmm. Absolutely amazing. Yeah, someone that was so passionate about women's football. Yeah, yeah. he believed in, in, in women being able to play football. It's that simple. Mm -hmm. You know, the, it's a very simple story and a very simple belief, which is how people would probably see it today. Well, of course, girls play football, we can see today. Mm -hmm. Still needs to be a lot more work with grassroots, etc. But what a vision to have in those days in the 60s and 70s. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. When we were in Boston uh, for the one show, we had a recorded message given to us after we'd found Paula and Jean for the squad that were there from. Jill Scott from the current England ladies team um, and thanking us for our contribution to women's football for all those years ago, which actually meant a great deal to all the women that were there from our Mexico 71 squad. How then would you reflect on that whole experience, the World Cup, what's happened since then, your football experience altogether, quite a big question. <laughs> How do you reflect on it, uh, Chris? Um, well, as I've said before, I think uh, for our, in our case, we were very lucky um, that we were in the right place in the right time and to have the experience we had. And I, and I don't think, I could have been in a in a in a better position mm -hmm. in my football career, mm -hmm. well, if you call it a career. Because, but um, for what the experience we had, and I and I believe that um, in some ways it was better then because we were left to our own devices as such. We weren't we weren't um, 
we were we played football for for the football reasons and not for commercialization or or stereotyping people we, we were just there playing for the love of the game mm -hmm. um so uh if i have any regrets it's perhaps that i packed up earlier than you know because i i remember having a conversation with my nephew we used to be season ticket holders and he used to play on a sunday and then when he got older he had to play on a saturday and he said what shall i do shall i shall I carry on watching football or shall I play? And I said to him, play as long as you can, because mm -hmm. you can watch football all your life, mm -hmm. but you can't play all your life. So, um, Well, it's yeah. not too late, is it? Huh? It's not too late. <laughs> <laughs> you play walking football. <laughs> yeah, well, actually, the Wii is one of our, uh, you know, one of the squads. She does do walking football. Yes, she does. Um, because when I was 41, I played in indoor football for my works team uh -huh. and I got a trophy player of the tournament and I was all showy-offy about it, mm -hmm. thinking, oh, nobody's going to have a trophy like, you know, none of the girls are going to have one in their 40s. Uh -huh. And there's we, she won one about six months ago. <laughs> <laughs> And Jan, Jan Ems, she's won loads of trophies playing badminton. So, um, yeah, so I've just shoved it back in the cupboard now. <laughs> <laughs> How about you, Jill? Um, yeah, I mean, as Chris was saying, you know, we loved our football back then as well. You know, it, it was for the love of the game. And um, I was just fortunate I didn't get injured that, that much. And I, I played in, in most most games that I could and you know I've had a, a, a daughter in between playing that as well you know alongside um, so nothing would stop you playing if you wanted to play mm -hmm. um, but there you go it's it's um, I wouldn't I'd say I wouldn't probably wouldn't change anything the way I, I played my football and the chances I had to play it. And how about you Leah? I think Jill and Chris have, have said it all, really. Um, it, it's just been a fantastic, it was a fantastic time to play. You never lose the love of kicking a ball. It doesn't matter what age you are. Mm -hmm. um, I've said it many times, someone rolls a ball to you. The first thing you do is flick it up and kick it. Um, I think it's fantastic for the young girls and women now, how the game is going. It's developing you know, we'd like it all to go a bit quicker, but then sometimes the best things take longer. So we'll just see it develop and it will become a natural part of women's sport. And that's really what it should be. It should just be another sport that women and girls can play, mm -hmm. like all the other sports. Um, and when it reaches that and there's no stigma at all to it, um, everyone's achieved their little bit that they part they played over the years. How, in your opinion, has women's football progressed since you played? So talking about grassroots football or professional football, what do you think about that, uh, Chris? Um, well, I think because of social media, it's helped tremendously. Um, you know, if you see, if you, it's not like when we were young and we've all said, oh, we thought we were the only girl footballer when we were little. Now. You can go on social media, you can join a team. And yeah, things have um, changed tremendously because of that. And, and, and that is the reason, the attention, if social media had been around when we came back from Mexico, people would have known about it. True. But because, um, because um, it was just newspapers, mm -hmm. etc. everything was owned by, if they didn't want to report it, that was it. Mm -hmm. it didn't you didn't get reported about, so it's a difference. Yeah. Um, I think one thing I do want to say, just relating to like what you're saying about media coverage and things like that. So the women's game does have so much more media coverage, but I think it's really important that people are aware of the fact that a lot of the time still, it's media coverage doesn't talk about female footballers' skill, but actually it talks about 
how people look and like women's yeah. footballers these days still have to look a certain way to be and play football I mean I'm not saying they have to look a certain way but there's a pressure on women that play football now to look a certain way and I think if you just go into Google and type in women's football women's soccer the first pictures you will get up have got nothing to do with <laughs> play football yeah I think that is the worst thing about it to be mm -hmm. honest mm. You're right. Um, I think you should be judged on your ability mm -hmm. and nothing else. But uh, sadly, but you have to look a certain way. Mm -hmm. And I know you've, you've got to be role models and this that, and the other, but it doesn't matter. If, you, if you've got the ability, mm -hmm. if you're the best player in England, you should have that England shirt on. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. Definitely. Just saying about looking a certain way, do they, they don't look at it in the men's game the same way do they exactly like I think as women there's like a double pressure on you like you have to be a good footballer but that has to also be in line with you look in a certain way and sort of playing that role of you know being on tv and people looking at you and it still is like that 100% and it that is something that really needs to change I mean if you if you look back on um team photographs through the years mm -hmm. how how it has changed you know you, you'd get a, a bunch of girls together, they were all in the same kit, but they were all individuals. Yeah. We, we weren't all the same mould, mm -hmm. but no. now, like you're saying, you have to look a certain way. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, the, that, that shouldn't be in the women's game. Mm -hmm. we should, they should be treated as individuals and on their skill levels. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. What would you say to girls and women that are considering playing football? Chris? I would say go for it. It's the best thing you'll ever do. Um, it will keep you fit. It, keep, it, it keeps you focused. It can bring you a, a lot of things apart from football. Um, and um, yeah, don't ever let anybody put you off. And if you've got a dream, you go for it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Jill? Yeah, yeah, exactly that, Chris. Um, you know, if, if the girls want to play from a young age, just encourage them as much as you can. Um, because as I know, it, that's all I wanted to do. And nobody was going to discourage me. Uh, you know, you, you'd get a few remarks, but now I think the opportunities are there for the girls. Mm -hmm. you, there's so many openings it can make for you. Mm -hmm. um, lifelong friends, being part of a team, as Chris said, focused, and it gives you a purpose, a reason, something to look forward to as well. It's just great. Mm -hmm. It's really great to be a part of. And Leo, what about you? Um, again, I think Chris and Jill have said it all. I think it's just important that um, whether you're female or male, if you have a passion for a sport or a hobby, you, you should follow it. You should do what you want to do be committed it gives you discipline it team sports you like again jill and chris have said lifelong friends mm -hmm. um it gives you learn teaches you resilience um certainly it will give you confidence mm. it's just something that you just need to embrace and not worry about what people say that it's be an individual um, and, and enjoy it. If you want to play a sport, you should play a sport. And um, girls and women should play football and enjoy it for what it is. And be the best you can, which will be all you can do. Well, thank you all so much. That's the end of these three chats. It's been so interesting to talk to you all. Um, I already knew quite a lot about your story, obviously, but just to like talk over it and find out more about it. And it's an amazing story. And I really hope that more and more people find out about it and can hear about what you've done because it's fantastic. And it's so inspirational for girls and women playing football to hear about your story the challenges that you've been through and your experiences in general. So thanks so much for doing the, the interviews. Right. Well, thank you, thank Ella, you. Thank for you, having Ella. the interest and, yeah. and wanting to put the story out there. That's important to all of us and the, the squad are listening to these and, and they'll be thrilled. And 
yeah, we can't thank you enough. And I hope if it inspires one young girl to play and carry on, so that would be fabulous. Thank oh. you very much, Ella. Yeah, it's been brilliant talking about it all. Yeah. yeah.